would take ice cream cones and tip them upside down and paint them green and put all kinds of like M&Ms or decorations to make it look like there was a Christmas tree. I'm talking to my mom about something that was one of my favorite Christmas traditions when I was growing up. And I also had a cookie cutter that we could cut out reindeers. So I had reindeers and then I'd put a glob of frost in and have the reindeer stand up. It really looked like a, a Santa's village. Every year, around the beginning of December, she would come home from the grocery store with a bag full of goodies. Boxes of Nilla wafers, those individually wrapped caramel squares, gumdrops and those candies shaped like little spearmint leaves, candy sprinkles and marshmallows and M&Ms and confectioner sugar and vanilla cake frosting. She'd get to work making a special dough from scratch. She got the recipe from a magazine. And then the kitchen windows would steam up and the whole place would smell like molasses and ginger and cloves and cinnamon. And after everything had cooled and set, she'd use the cake frosting to hold the pieces together as she assembled them into a gingerbread house. And then my four siblings and I would decorate it with all of those items from the goodie bag. Caramels would turn into a chimney, Nilla wafers would become roof tiles, spearmint leaves as front shrubs, gumdrops and M&Ms for various kinds of decorative trim, and dusted with a coat of confectioner sugar. The deal was, on Christmas morning, we were allowed to eat the gingerbread house. But until then, it was look but don't touch. You remember Hansel and Gretel, don't you? I mean, if you wanted to create something specifically designed to tempt a child beyond all hope of self-control, you would create a gingerbread house. It was torture. But on Christmas morning, after the gifts were open and the Christmas breakfast was over, and as stale as the thing had gotten by then, that wasn't enough to stop five little cookie monsters from tearing the house down. And looking back, I'm pretty surprised that with five kids in the house, the thing even made it to Christmas. Very mysteriously, though, um, at certain times, goodies would disappear off the gingerbread house. No one's saying they did. I guess it was just one of Santa's elves. It wasn't me, I swear. You know, because of my mom, my siblings and I still love making gingerbread houses, even to this day. That's how traditions work. They get passed down from generation to generation. But just how this tradition got started, well, that's a bit of a mystery. I'm Brian Earle. This is Christmas Past. Let's go back all the way to the turn of the 11th century. Traders returning from the Middle East were just starting to introduce the ginger root to Europe. At first it was used medicinally to treat digestive issues and even hangovers, but then it was used as a spice, and it was also discovered that it could be a good preservative. This is probably a big part of the reason it caught on. Preserving food was really important in those days before packaging and refrigeration. And eventually along comes gingerbread. Now, the word itself has a surprising history, because maybe you've noticed that most gingerbread isn't really like bread at all, so why the name? Well, the earliest known recipes bear almost no resemblance to what we know today. In the first place, they were called gingerbras, which was borrowed from an old French term meaning simply preserved ginger. Those recipes called for boiling breadcrumbs and honey with ginger and other spices like licorice and pepper. The result was more like a confection than a cake or a bread. Nevertheless, by the 14th century, gingerbras had morphed into gingerbread. Now, it's no surprise that we would eventually make houses out of gingerbread when you consider that it has a long history of being turned into other eye-catching works of art. Bakers would press the dough into ornately carved molds or press a decorative stamp into cooked dough when it was still warm. They'd be dusted with sugar to highlight the designs or often gilded and iced. They'd come in countless shapes and designs, and these gingerbread molds are actually displayed in some museums in Europe. Of course, stamped and molded gingerbread pieces eventually gave way to the now familiar gingerbread man. And the first documented example of gingerbread cookies cut into a figure was in the court of Queen Elizabeth I. Now here's where things get a little bit interesting. We know that gingerbread houses first showed up in Germany sometime in the 19th century. But why is a bit of a mystery. There's no doubt they became common after the Brothers Grimm published Hansel and Gretel in 1812. But historians disagree on whether gingerbread houses were already a common thing before that. In other words, it's possible that the Brothers Grimm invented the gingerbread house with their story. Or maybe they didn't. What is certain, though, is that after Hansel and Gretel, 
bakers in Germany started selling ornamented fairy tale style gingerbread houses, which became popular during Christmas. And that tradition came to America with the German immigrants who settled in Pennsylvania. It's interesting that the word gingerbread is also used to describe the intricate fretwork you see in some styles of architecture, like you see in those Victorian painted ladies in San Francisco. So I guess it was only a matter of time before someone would build an actual San Francisco Victorian out of gingerbread. The holiday display at the Fairmont San Francisco is really a destination. It's become this um, tradition for people to come and visit the hotel. That's Melissa Ferrar. Like Ferrari without the E sound. <laughs> and she's the director of marketing communications at the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco. Every year, the Fairmont creates a life-size gingerbread house. I mean, you can actually walk inside it and puts it on display in the lobby. So it's really this experience that you really participate in. And I think it is, I mean, it's, it's seeing kids see this giant gingerbread house and their eyes lighting up, but also seeing the adults. It kind of brings out the kid and the adults. So it's just an amazing and fun experience for everyone involved. Thousands of people come to see it each year. And this thing includes almost 8,000 individual gingerbread bricks and 700 pounds of candy and a ton of royal icing. Now, don't worry, it's San Francisco, so everything's composted afterward. Everything, that is, that doesn't fall into the sneaky little hands of hungry visitors. It's like Willy Wonka, you know. It's just there right in front of them, and I think people just can't help themselves sometimes. But we do have signs saying, you know, Santa's watching. Well, I can't wait to see this year's gingerbread house in person. And if you're interested in seeing what the house has looked like in years past, well, head right on over to christmaspastpodcast.com and check out the show notes for this episode. You'll see pictures of that, a guide to making gingerbread houses courtesy of King Arthur Flower, and even some pictures of my mom's gingerbread houses. Thanks to everyone for permission to put those on there. Again, that's christmaspastpodcast.com. And now let's hear a Christmas memory from Lisa, who lives in Belgium. This one requires a little bit of setup. Every year, the website reddit.com has a secret Santa program that anyone can sign up for, and it's just what it sounds like. You'll send someone a gift, and someone will send you one in return. I did it last year, and it's a lot of fun. I got this wooden cutout of a bicycle because I indicated that cycling is one of my hobbies. I'm definitely going to do it again this year, and if you're interested, just come to christmaspasspodcast.com, check out the show notes for this episode, and I'll put a link in. Now, this program is worldwide, and as you might imagine, sometimes things don't quite work out the way they're supposed to. One of the things you can do when you sign up is volunteer to be a rematch Santa. What that means is if there's someone who is expecting a gift, but for whatever reason it doesn't arrive, you'll make sure that they get one anyway. And that's what Lisa did. She wanted to give and not receive, but sometimes these things have a way of working their own magic, and she ended up receiving something very unexpected. I actually received a best gift ever on Christmas Day when I messaged my rematch giftee. We hit it off almost right away. We exchanged numbers and then after hours and hours of talking and lying awake together and I just suggested we should meet at the steps of the Sacré Coeur in Paris on Valentine's Day. And then we did it. Um, we actually booked our tickets to Paris. I just knew that he was the one. And as I'm recording this, we're together for six months. So this Christmas was life-changing, and I got the biggest and best Christmas gift ever. My goodness, that all sounds very, very European. Hey, if you want to share a Christmas memory, it's super easy. All you have to do is record a voice memo on your phone and email it to me at christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com. Try to keep it to about a minute and be sure to say your name and where you're from. Also, if you're shy about recording your own voice, that's fine. You can just write me an email and maybe I'll get a chance to share it here on the show. Again, that's christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com. Christmas Past is produced in sunny San Mateo, California by yours truly, Ryan Earl. I'd like to thank my mom and also Melissa Ferrar. Like Ferrari without the E sound. <laughs> and also thanks to Lisa in Belgium. Hey, I know that last Christmas is a tough act to follow, but I hope this year is just as merry and bright. If you're not yet subscribed to the podcast, well, it's just one click or tap away. Check it out on iTunes or however you get your podcasts. That way, when a new episode comes, you don't have to worry about it. It's delivered right to you, and we can keep the Christmas spirit going together all season long. And of course, we can keep things going between episodes on social media. 
Come by Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and search for Christmas Past Podcast in all three places. That's where you'll find me and all of the fun vintage Christmas stuff and Christmas trivia I'm posting all the time. Well, that'll do it for this episode. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you next time.